so that our temperature, if we don't do anything, like the temperature is trending this way, right now we're here, we expect to kind of, or even looking here, here's where the black line is where we think we should be, and we're too cool, so we expect that we might catch up. Very similar to this model right here, there's this green one here that actually cooled, and then in two or three or four years, popped back up. So no matter what, if it's cooling or warming, it's still going The trend up. is still in that direction, just oh. like when you're walking the dog. Right. This, the, the black line is like the, where the odor is going, mm -hmm. and you're seeing the, the deviations there. So just to make sure I'm understanding you, <clears throat> we've basically gone, we've climbed up and we're just sort of hovering at the top nasty shelf, basically. I mean, it's still not, not a great place to be, but we're just kind of hanging out at So level. we've been hovering here. Right. If you look at the black line, it was going up, whereas right. the yellow is, is kind of flat line. So do you have prime su suspects for the loving yet, or are you pretty confident that it's just kind of the way the dice have rolled? Um, I would say that it's probably, there's two camps. Some people think that some of those volcanoes have caused some cooling, uh, as well as um, some air pollution, extra air pollution, those aerosols in, in Asia. Mm -hmm. Those could be suspects for part of the cooling. But you can't explain all of it like that. And so the only way to explain both pieces is that the oceans have, uh, and now we can measure, the oceans have trapped lots of heat into the middle and deep ocean right now. They've been able to measure that that area is accumulating a lot of uh, heat. Eventually it will slosh over, go to the surface ocean, which will then warm the atmosphere. Oh, so in other words, what we're capable of measuring is kind of hiding some of the heat? Maybe? Well, if the heat is coming from the, from the greenhouse gases, the trapping heat, redirecting it, the oceans absorb it, but that the oceans over the last 10 years have kind of, have uh, the ocean circulations have caused that heat to move deeper. That's what I mean. It's yeah. kind of hiding the heat. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. yeah, so it's hiding it. Okay. And right. then we expect it to, at some point, slosh back up. <coughs> so we do expect to catch up. So it's even going to get warmer even naturally, even without our human effects. Yeah, so this would be part of a natural cycle, but right. we are putting okay. a very strong force in so that when, so since this black line is what we expect to happen, is it to continue to warm? We expect to catch back up. Is the yellow the five-year average, moving average, or is that the actual? That's the year-to-year -year temperature. Year-to-year. -year. So does that include 2014? No. Okay, so 2014. I think 2014 is up starting to catch up. Yeah. 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 And this is the global average. Global average. And you're not really dealing with all of the variability. So when you look at more local, you see a lot more variation. Um, we have a website that we manage called temperaturetrends.org, and uh, you can see the, the U.S. temperatures, um, and actually by congressional district. So we look at all the congressional districts, and we calculate the temperature trends if there's enough data. And uh, California, 2014, was by far the warmest year ever. It had this enormous jump. Um, doesn't mean it's going to continue that way. It's part of the variability. So when you go to smaller scales, you see a lot more. I'm curious why you did it by congressional district for communica communication yeah. purposes. Yeah. Because what we want is my my goal is to get kids that are like sixth graders to understand what's going on, to go visit their local policymakers and teach them about climate change and say, hey, look at our congressional district. I know that's all you care about. Here in our congressional <laughs> district, what is been changing? I want you to do something about it. I think I can kind of mitigate on the gerrymandering too. Maybe, maybe so. <laughs> So the conclusions of, of this analysis was that the hiatus of warming of 11 years is more likely than not for most emission scenarios. So this is not that unusual. Um, it, took us, uh, it took us two and a half years to get this paper published. We just got it accepted um, a couple weeks ago because uh, it has so much statistics in there. And people love to fight about, scientists love to fight about statistics. Uh, it did improve our paper, all the peer review and all the rejections. Um, but. Uh, but also, we found that global temperatures will continue to warm unless emissions are reduced, which isn't a new uh, conclusion at all. But it does lead into the kind of next part of the talk that I wanted to share with you. But uh, what's going to happen in the future? Well, uh, this is a, a, a group of climate model simulations that show for the current emission scenario that we are on, um, this is how temperatures will change in the next hundred years. And if you look at the last period and some of the impacts, you know, Cal uh, United States issued a climate assessment report last year saying all the stuff that climate, all the impact that climate change is having on the United States. 
And that's only with about a degree, this is in the Fahrenheit, it's only about a degree temperature change. And now imagine what the United States would be like with, you know, eight degrees of temperature change. It's staggering. So, um, what can we do to change the future? And that's, I'm sure, why you're involved in, in, in this field that you are. Um, now, of course, there's a lot of kind of technology, um, solar farms and, uh, and wind turbines. Actually, this guy's named Todd Pellman. He's a, uh, an engineer who uh, developed this residential wind turbine. Um, and it was the first one that was permitted in, for use in, in San Francisco. Um, just trying something new. Um, there's this, uh, you know, concentrated solar technology, which has its pluses or minuses, but it does generate a lot of energy um, using mirrors. Um, of course, we're starting to see the electrification of transportation, which makes sense if you get your electricity from something like this. Um, and just locally, we have, you know, uh, real serious consideration into using bicycles as a transportation measure, like they do in Northern Europe. Um, and things like heat pumps uh, and high-speed um, transport. So um, that actually is, is comfortable and smooth, unlike the Caltrain I take every day, which I feel like I'm riding a horse, you know, coming in. Um, so it's sufficient to say, you've learned it in many of your classes, we do have the technology uh, to reduce emissions. Um, but I want to share with you something. You might have seen this before. But uh, here's the challenge is that uh, in terms of carbon emissions, uh, since 1850, we've taken fossil fuels that are in the ground, we've burned them, and that has added 1,500 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere um, since 1850. As a result of that, the temperature of the planet's warmed by a degree and a half or something. If we wanted to keep the, uh, the planet below two degrees Celsius warming, which is kind of the, the this is what the United Nations has agreed on as, a, as the target, is let's, if we can keep the temperature below two, 2 degrees Celsius warming, we could probably deal with those impacts. I mean, there are going to be impacts, but we could probably deal with it. If we let it go further than that, then it gets more difficult. So that's actually almost the only thing that the international agreements, <laughs> the last Copenhagen thing, is almost the only thing they agreed on, is let's shoot for two. And let's talk else. about shooting for two. Yeah, we'll talk about shooting we'll for talk two. We'll talk about maybe talking about shooting for two. Yeah. Well, th at, least we'll have, well, at least we know that two is the yeah, number. Exactly. <laughs> we yeah. don't really do anything about it, but at least that. Right. Um, so how much more can we safely emit to keep it at two? Well, um, it's about 500 gigatons. And the challenge is, is there's at least 3,000 in the ground. But there's a ton left of oil and coal and natural gas. And so if we keep burning it at the current rate, you know, before we get to this another 500, it's 15 to 25 years, it might even be faster. Um, but the, the bottom line is, and this came out in, of the report from the um, Bank of England, actually, recently, who's decided to divest from fossil fuel investments, which is very interesting. But basically they said, we've got to leave about 80% of the carbon in the ground. We cannot burn at all, otherwise we're going to screw up the planet. And, and they actually don't care about screwing up the planet, they care about screwing up the economy. Because if you screw up the economy, then the monetary system's all messed up, and you have jobs, and then we can't do anything about the environment anyhow. So, um, and that's, that, that's why that article that came in The Guardian I thought was quite interesting, because it had an economic perspective. And people are realizing that the environment and the, econo and the economics of our planet are so tightly linked that we can't, no longer can we just ignore and just talk about, you know, GDP, gross domestic product, and economic things, that we have to consider the environment. Otherwise, we're not going to get there. The problem is that the banks all think on a two or three year window, corporations think on a quarterly window, um, politicians on a four year or two year, and there's no one thinking on a longer horizon, which isn't now so long, it's like 20 or 30 years. It's a challenge. So this is our, our big challenge. And I don't know that any of us have any bright ideas of exactly what to do about this, because it really involves humans to such a large extent. But, uh, but I'll, I'll share with you at least kind of my evolution of what happened in my life regarding these kind of thoughts. So um, there's two things I like. There's a lot of things I like, but these are two things I'm especially fond of. Bicycling <laughs> um, and, uh, and burritos. 
And I'll talk about some of that a little bit uh, with you. Um, in, in fact, I do like burritos quite a bit. I created something called the Burrito Enjoyment Index, where I measure what the average American like, how much they enjoy burritos, and I compared it with my own. <laughs> Has this been peer reviewed? Uh, it hasn't. <laughs> We can do that for him today. Oh, good. So <laughs> no, we could do a little survey here. But it really led me onto this, uh, into looking at, at my affinity with burritos. And um, so I, I did something called a burrito showdown, where I compared the, uh, the carbon emissions of different types of burritos. For example, chicken burrito versus a beef burrito. And I was shocked to find such a large difference when just looking at two, a, a very simple decision when I go to a taqueria, am I going to have chicken or beef or vegetarian? And, you know, that this is like eight pounds of carbon emissions, which is like driving a car eight miles. In fact, I did a comparison. We did a comparison between eating and driving. And, for example, you have a, an SUV, which most people realize is not a fuel-efficient vehicle, and compare it to something, a hybrid. And you know there's a big difference. Um, and I found that, that your choice of diet can have a similar impact on our climate system as your choice of, of vehicle you drive. Now, what about the bicycle? Well... Where do you get your energy for a bicycle? From food. Burrito. From burritos. So um, what's the equivalent miles per gallon of bicycle? Well, it's certainly not zero because you need food. In fact, we did a calculation and we find out it's between 75 miles per gallon all the way up to 500 equivalent based on your choice of burrito. So if you're fueling yourself with beef burritos, you know, it's still good to be riding a bicycle, but not nearly as good as if you're choosing, for example, chicken or, or vegetarian. So it really does. Do you have a bean burrito on your on your A bean? A bean burrito, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, bean would be would would be in this in this region. Yeah. But of course, and you would know much more about this than myself, of course the different farms, different agricultural systems might have very different kind of numbers. Um, right. whether you're growing organically right. or not right. and what you these are organic But I, yeah. I would expect the bean burrito just in between your two bars mm -hmm. to be um, on average across the planet, about a hundredth of the chicken burrito. Or no, depending on how much chicken you have in it. So maybe a tenth of the chicken burrito. Uh -huh. It should still be a lot less. You, you know, it should. Um, Anyways, this is for a different time. No, it's a, good, it's a very good point. <laughs> because, you know, we were amazed at how low chicken was. It was basically right in the middle of all the vegetables. Legumes, you're right, were, were lower. But in terms of, of like, if you were having a vegetarian burrito and you got bell peppers in there, you know, oh, no. Oh, no. You know it's, it's, uh, it's the chicken is like the new vegetable because it's so efficient for them to grow this. These are 100,000 chickens in these low, you know, these indoor systems. They're not the happy chickens like things. Because it raises a few other questions. Oh, it raises, and, and these are things that you guys think about. But they're, but they're still eating corn. Yeah, I, mean, it's still, I know. It's still just a basic thermodynamic conversion issue, no matter what. It's certainly here to beef, but... Yeah. I, and there's also uh, Bidia, which I think might be uh, what is that? Uh, goat. Oh, okay. Might be worth it. Goat is pretty high because um, goats are ruminants and, and they pass the methane gas. So, Thank you. Thanks. Anyway, it's a longer conversation, but... Oh, it's an interesting. It's, thinking about it. it's a fascinating conversation. In fact, I spent uh, some time thinking about this kind of stuff. I've also heard people saying that we should start eating like insects, like crickets and ants and things like that. Yeah. And the people do in other places. Oh yeah. Well, mm -hmm. <laughs> there was a there was a play at San Jose Rep before mm -hmm. they closed. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. It was about baseball, venture capitalist startups. Game over. Yeah, and uh, eating of insects to do something about climate change. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting. Uh, yeah, that's cool. We didn't. This book that we published a few years ago, which is about food and climate change, and Laura Steck was the. Uh, she's a chef, and I was doing the science. That got me. Lead, that led me in this direction of thinking about food and climate change and, and personal behavior. At that time, we didn't have anything about insects. So that'd be a thing right now. People are talking about insects quite a bit. Um, but. Uh, one thing that when in, in writing this book, um, and I gave a lot of talks to a lot of different communities, um, but the one community I didn't get a chance to, to connect with were kids. And so I basically took the stories from our book and, and some of the things we've been discussing today, and we kind of I pitched them to the film and animation departments here at San Jose State, and they helped us invent something called the Green Ninja, 
which is a climate action superhero. And that was in about 2010 when we started um, trying to tell stories about climate change and things people can do um, for a youthful, more aimed at youth. So um, our mission is to educate young people about our change in climate and then really to give them the inspiration um, and tools to do something about it. So our goal is to get kids taking action on climate change. Um, we're target is primarily middle school right now, although it, changed, it changes, but right now we're focused on middle school. And our method is that we're really trying to use the story of a character like the Green Ninja um, and personal engagement and, and community connections. Um, and we're doing this inside a science curriculum, school-based science curriculum. So students have to do science anyhow. We want to make it fun and interesting and relevant in their community. Um, why children? Well, I mean, there's lots of reasons, but uh, going back to kind of an academic, um, these researchers report that children average a purchase influence attempt every two minutes when shopping with their parents. <laughs> you can almost imagine a little kid like you know, pulling on the parent's like, sweater and saying, I want that thing. Right? So kids do have an influence on, on, their, uh, on their parents. And, um, and they're going to be the ones who inherit um, our world anyhow. So we develop videos, and we work with the film school and the animation department here at San Jose State. We, uh, this week or next week will be our 32nd Green Ninja episode. Our second season is just finishing, uh, 16 episodes per season. Um, students are heavily involved in our videos. We're developing curriculum, middle school uh, curriculum right now for the new science standards. Um, and we train teachers. We help teachers learn about climate science and environmental studies um, so that they feel comfortable teaching these topics. Um, and our kind of overall, our, our internal motto is to make our content fun, informative, and actionable. So we want the content, we want students to have a good time. We want them to learn something. We want them to know about the kind of things they can do. So um, the, fun, the most enjoyable piece of all this is the videos, because I get to work with artists and, and students. And so this Green Ninja show, which we've created here on campus, um, has animations and live action and puppets and music videos. And so um, every episode is a little bit, you're not really sure what you're going to get. And some are better than others, but in general, um, we're getting about two to 3,000 views on YouTube a day. Um, so we're reasonably successful um, in terms of connecting our videos with, with people. I've been involved in some of this too, um, as Dr. Burrito. <laughs> and this was not my invention, but uh, David Chai, the, the artistic director, thought that since I like burritos, that we should have some episodes about burritos. And so I interrogate burritos and um, take the blood pressure of a burrito, I put probes in burritos, <laughs> I visit a burrito farm like this, um, all kinds of silly stuff. I thought I would show you just a, a quick example. This is just a. Uh, this works. Um. On this episode of the Green Ninja Show, from Paramus, New Jersey, asks. I want to help save the planet. I'm not too small to be a hero. That's not true, mate. Anyone can be a hero. Just watch this. Unless you show yourself, this steel can is going into the landfill. No, not the landfill! Every time a person does something to protect the planet, or teaches someone else to do the same, we're doing exactly what the Green Ninja does. So if you're searching for the Green Ninja, look no further. See, Megan, anyone can be a hero. Go be a hero. Bring it down. Bring it down. Bring it down. So that's the, uh, so these, uh, the intention of these videos are to be engagement pieces in the classroom. We are developing curriculum to kind of go along with videos. Um, we have a Green Ninja Film Festival. Students make their own Green Ninja films. We have an energy contest where students reduce their home energy use using their smart meters. Um, we, have a, we focus on a lot of hands-on activities, um, but we are trying to use humor to bridge what we know is a very challenging and can be a sobering subject. Imagine you're a 10-year-old 
and they're telling you that the planet is on a trajectory that doesn't look good for the eight or nine billion people who are going to be there with you. So, you know, we don't know what the best way is to, to change popular opinion. But we do know that when you are a teacher and you give an assignment, your students will do it. It's a great thing about being a professor here, <laughs> is you can force students to do any kind of crazy thing. And that's what we're trying to convince uh, middle school teachers to do, is to use our content um, to, to get their kids involved in, in doing things. Um, I'm just going to give a little uh, plug for uh, our Green Ninja crew here on campus. We have uh, an office in Tower Hall. If you're ever in Tower Hall, you come and visit us. Um, but uh, they decided that we're going to, we're always struggling for funding, as many nonprofits are. So we're doing something called the California Climate Ride, which is a ride from um, basically from Eureka down to San Francisco. It's 320 miles over five days. We have a team of eight riders, and, um, and we've been training, and uh, we have an uh, uh, Indiegogo campaign that we're running right now to raise money. The money goes to support SJSU students and uh, primarily students who work in the Green Ninja office or develop our media. Um, here's some of our team. Uh, Rami is a computer science student. She, the last time she rode a bike was when she was in India just going to the grocery store. And she signed up. And then Huang, I taught her how to ride a bicycle. She didn't know how. And now she's riding, going to ride 320 miles, although she's still falling a little too frequently than I would prefer. Um, but, uh, but it's a really, it's a really fun project and program to be involved in um, because students and faculty work so closely around a around common mission. So um, thank you for listening to, to this. And I'd be happy to chat about anything that kind of comes up. I was, uh, I was talking to you before you started about I have a 14 month old daughter. Uh -huh. and I'm not sure if you heard uh, the, the artist Raffi. Uh, he, he, he appeals to young children's songs and I'm brainwashed by Raffi right now. Uh -huh. And he, he, it's something, he's, he's very pro-environment. He has all kinds of uh, songs geared towards food sourcing, uh, uh, farms, especially with the farm and food sourcing, and it's really good, wholesome music. And I think you know to get them even younger. Middle school is nice, but to get that uh, music and um, that song into their head, and and, and, uh, and what we do, we, we we play that music and you know, we do the artsy stuff with her right now. And hopefully, she can keep, continue that. I completely agree with you, um, and the literature does supports that as well. So um, if you wanted to get young people interested in, in science, let's just say, doesn't mean uh, climate science or environmental science, um, that they start to make those decisions in middle school, maybe seventh grade, but and earlier. So that's kind of the limit. The reason we're focusing on middle school right now is that the new science standards explicitly for the first time include climate change, human impact, and engineering. Um, which are all pieces of, of solutions. So um, that's why we're, we're starting really at sixth grade. And then our plan is to go to fifth and to fourth and to third. Um, Green Ninja fits in well with younger audiences. Um, some of our animations, I'm sure that even very, very young kids enjoy and enjoy animated things. Um, music is a, an important piece, I think, especially for, for younger learners. So I agree with you. Um, we don't think that middle school, sixth grade is actually our target, really. We don't think sixth grade is too old yet, um, but we definitely are going to, once we finish the sixth grade curriculum, we're going to go to fifth and then fourth, um, just for the exact reasons you Yeah, the green into the, how the vibrant colors and all that stuff, it's great. I like it. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. I mean, that's the, the goal. Yeah. Yes? I, I have um, sort of three different things that you have simultaneously huh? that I want one of them is I struggled with our students here and also with my own children, like Brian, um, with, and, and influenced, uh, or I, I, we shared among the faculty the Jonathan Franson article in the New York Times this week, I don't know if you saw it, but talking about this, this um, disempowerment that is natural with climate change because it's global, mm -hmm. it feels as though it's too big for the individual. And so Franzen talks about how Seeing a bird and caring about a bird is a much easier, like saving a bird that's running into a building. And you contrast that with 
global climate change and the carbon footprint, mm -hmm. which is can be disempowering. I see with my 14-year-old, um, her college counselor said, well, if you want to get into a good college, you should do something like with the environment. Of course, her mother says they're shutting up. And, um, <laughs> and then she hears her daughter say, it's too scary. I can't even do that. It's too scary. There's no, there's no, no way out. I have no power there. Yeah. And it gets at least her locus of control stuff. How, sorry, stuff. Her, her, in, her, <laughs> her very um, insightful research on locus of control, this feeling of what can I really do. So I'm just curious how you, um, how you bridge uh, that feeling of powerlessness that the individual has. I was sort of interested in your, in your um, congressional district approach, but how you tie my driving an electric car with my solar panels to us, the Saudis deciding that they're going to keep pumping as much oil into the um, market as they possibly can just to try to drive under yeah. The, whatever, the U.S. oil producers. I mean, it just feels so... Like we're, How do you do it? Well, I don't know. I mean, to be honest. <laughs> no, 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 wrong answer. It's, no. <laughs> it's, it's very challenging, I agree. Um, we do, we want kids to feel empowered. Yeah. Um, we have this home energy activity where kids are asked to see if they can reduce their energy use. They're tracking with the pg e smart meter. Um, we do use financial um, when, when, it's, when it's there. In that case, you can save your family money by being smarter in your home. Um, but it's the kind of fundamental challenge that climate change has, is that it's not local, that it's off in the future, and that it's not just direct.